the STD HIV Prevention Training Center at Johns Hopkins. And your next speaker is Dr. Anna Mpala. Um, she's the medical director for the Prevention Training Center. She's a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins. And she has been on sabbatical in Malaysia teaching um, graduate students medicine. So she's here for the United States for a couple more weeks and then she'll be going back to Malaysia. So welcome, Dr. Mpala. I walk around, so bear with me. And if you have questions while I'm doing this, stop me and ask. And if I'm in your way, move me, okay? All right. We're going to talk about STIs and hepatitis C. We'll start with hepatitis C. I don't have any conflicts or disclosures. Maybe that's sad, but I just, I don't. All right. So at the end of this webinar I have here, but it's a lecture. Um, you'll be able to describe risk factors for and management of, on a rudimentary level, hepatitis C, and discuss the transmission detection and treatment and management of common sexually transmitted infections. So here we go. Let's talk about hepatitis C. Oh, here we go. If we had those little clickers, we would do that. But answer in your head. All right. Which is true. Hepatitis C cannot be transmitted sexually. HCV usually causes an acute hepatitis. Over half of people infected with HCV will develop chronic hepatitis. Transmission of HCV to others only happens in the acute phase of infection. Okay, so I want you to think about those. Think what you would answer, because we don't have those little bars. You know, I love those things, but we don't have them today. Okay. HCV is the most common chronic blood-borne infection in the U.S., okay? You can't efficiently transmit it sexually. It's not efficiently transmitted. I would never say never. I've learned that when I was a fellow. Don't ever say never. Um, there are some situations where men who had sex with men who had developed a proctitis symptom from what we call chancroid uh, did develop hepatitis C and it was sexually transmitted. And there's some cases, I swear, that you might have run across where you, there is no other way that you can document and you think it might be sexually transmitted. But I'm telling you, when you counsel people, this is a hard thing to transmit sexually. Newly infected are either asymptomatic or have mild disease. So it's not like you think, oh, hepatitis A. Uh, it's usually pretty stealth. HCV RNA can be de detected in blood within one to three weeks after exposure. So I'm going to show you a slide that's going to like blow you away with the testing. You can get it on the CDC website. Don't panic, okay? You don't have to memorize it, just know where it is. Anti-HCV, antibodies to HCV, can be detected in over 97% of people within a six-month period. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you can make this diagnosis. Chronic hepatitis C, however, develops in 70 to 85% of those people that are infected. So, yeah, yeah. Acute liver disease develops in 60 to 70% of those people who have chronic infection. <sighs> okay. Most infected persons are unaware of infection because they're not critically ill. They don't, you know, they're not critically ill, but they can transmit to others. Okay. So, right now this picture looks pretty dismal, doesn't it? There are a lot of other manifestations of hepatitis C that's not all about the liver. It's outside the liver. And that can be like rheumatoid, like rheumatic, you know, symptoms, joint problems. You can have dry eyes, uh, skin rashes, like in plainness. Your kidneys can be involved with glomerular nephritis. Maybe you have a presentation that looks like a lymphoma. Uh, cryoglobulins in the blood are up, and you can be depressed. So there's a lot of different manifestations of this besides the liver. How do you transmit? How many here are work with injection drug users? Okay, we're all in there. Okay, we know this. Okay, parental exposure to contaminated blood. Injection drug use with shared needles or works. Just like HIV. Except this one is getting away on us. But I have good news. It's not all bad news. I have good news. 
Needle sticks in healthcare settings, we have to be careful, there's no vaccine. Rarely through rec receipt of blood, tissue, and organs, because we're doing active screening for this. And then perinatal exposure. What's sex? Here you go, here's sex. Sexual transmission rare, but it can occur especially among HIV infected persons. 10% of persons with acute hepati uh, hepatitis C virus report contact with a known HCV infected partner. That's what I was saying. This is, their, this is the risk. We have no other risk. And risk increases commensurate with the number of sex partners you have. That's with any STI, right? The more partners you have, the higher the chance you're going to pick up something, and it won't be good. All right, so which one is true? Over hepatitis C can't be transmitted sexually. Yeah, it can. It's not efficient, but it can. HCV usually causes um, an acute hepatitis. Not done. Stealth. But this one, over half of people infected do develop chronic hepatitis. That one's true. And it can transmit at any phase. Okay. Because it's blood. Oh, you can't even see this. This is at the CDC. CDC.gov backslash hepatitis. You can get this. That's where I got it. So you can get it right down there. And it kind of tells you, and you can't even see it, and I can't see it, and I'm not going to read it, but it kind of walks you through the blood tests and what they mean and when to do them. Okay? So instead of going through every single thing, just pull it down, make a copy. If you're doing this, stick it up in front of your desk, and you can refer to it. Look at this. These are all the approved tests. And again, I can't even see this from back there. Um, there are a lot of tests out there. Obviously, what we do is we see in the health departments and, and in outreach which test is, is cheapest and the best. And again, you know your algorithm, but find what you're doing. Make sure you have it, know where to call, how to send it, and all that. And that's all I have to say. We're not doing all that. Um, again, all CDC, all CDC. It'll tell you what does this mean if this is positive, this is negative. Bottom line is, here's the interpretation. Antibodies to hepatitis C. Oh, yeah, this isn't, okay. Yeah, oh, boy, this is far away. All right, if I am eight, and this is whether I have active RNA, the virus is replicating in my blood. Positive, positive, acute, or chronic? <laughs> Could be either. Positive antibodies, negative in the blood, it's resolution of HCV. Could be, and again, there's always an acute during period of low level viremia. Negative positive, early, because you don't have time to make the antibodies, but you still have that virus in the blood. Negative, negative absence of hepatitis C virus. If you want to pull out any of the slides, this one probably is your best one. Now, treatment. Combination therapy with a pegylated interferon and ribavirin is the treatment of choice for hepatitis, in chronic hepatitis C patients. And this is, uh, this is a slide that, that's clipped from the New England Journal article that kind of showed how people are doing. Let me say this. Okay. I listened to Dr. Bartlett give this talk about six weeks ago, and he was so excited because there are so many new drugs coming down the pike for this. I mean, new, okay, they're gonna be expensive at first. There's no doubt about it, okay? We know that. But eventually, as more, you know, it, they're, they're gonna come down in cost. And he believed that we sh could be able to actually annihilate this virus because he thinks that we can actually cure patients who are of hepatitis C with the drugs. What? Yeah. Uh, I love Dr. Bartlett. <laughs> <laughs> However, hepatitis C treatment is expensive, oh, yes. and not only is it expensive, getting it, uh, the testing funded, I mean, where do we go? We're in a situation now where statewide and citywide, I know. the funding is not available. So even if, the, even if we perform the test and identify now we got a person we've identified. We got a person that's um, inadequately insured. Right, I hear you. I, so we and got yes. a person walking around with hepatitis. He's yeah. right. I mean, but 
I know this. <laughs> this breaks my heart, and we, we have talked about this. But what I want you to hold on to, listen, like I said, these are expensive. You know where we are. I hope and pray that, you know, in the coming up in the future, and I hope the future is fast, <laughs> we will have this. And I think what the hope is, is that there are medications that can potentially eradicate the virus, and that's what we have to hold on to. Yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, we can't screen. Yeah, we don't have enough money. Nobody has insurance. I'm with you. But I want you to hold on to the fact that it's not as dismal as my first slide showed. That's what you got to Don't lose that faith. Yes, you had so two people back here. Yes. I guess I was listening to what the gentleman was saying, and I'm going back almost 10 years ago. I was at the uh, press, press, what is it, press room, press, uh, I'm sorry? Press release. press release room. And they were having a seminar. This was almost 10 years ago when they were first talking about hepatitis C. Yeah. It was a Dr. Banks that was doing it. I don't know if anyone's familiar with her, but she, it, because of the cost and because of the concern and no money was out there, that she was doing it for any and everybody just come and see her. So I have concerns. This is almost 10 years ago. They have the same two medications that they talked about and nothing really has, is going No, but further. there is change. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, no. There's a lot of change. In the past, like, two years, it's gone crazy with the new drugs that have been developed. There's like 60 drugs in pipeline. Oh, so those two that you have? Yeah, no, there are many new drugs coming up. Let me, let me go through this slide and I'll come back. I just wanted to, to kind of piggyback on what you said is the fact that um, there are several other drugs that are available. Oh, yeah. And there are treatments that are available for free in D.C. I don't know about other areas, but um, Grubbs Pharmacy is doing one currently right now that is free. Excuse me. But, you know, as we know, particularly for my population, let me just say, um, clients won't go. Well, now, now that's a different, available. that's a different battle. And it is free. That's a different and battle. And through NIH. Okay. I'll get the call. You talk to him. <laughs> okay. What's well, new? Treatment with pegylated interferon and ribavirin cures only about 45%, and they have to be of the <coughs> genotype that responds. 2011, the FDA approved the first two linear protease inhibitors. These two protease inhibitors are, are great. They're expensive, but they're great. And that's probably what DC has. Although these approvals mark an important advance in treatment, the drugs have many limitations. We have to watch toxic effects, um, and they have to be combined. But I'm telling you, the ones in the pipeline are, are looking like they don't have so many toxic effects, and we can, maybe can get away from uh, pegylated interferon and maybe even ribavirin with these new drugs. So keep tuned is what I want to say. Okay, here you go. I mean, this is, again, CDC. Pull it down. This is what you do, uh, how long, what to add, uh, and how they did. All right. Which of these statements is false? There's no vaccine for hepatitis C. Immunoglobulin gives some protection against hepatitis C after needle stick exposure. HCV positive women need not avoid pregnancy or breastfeeding. HCV HIV co-infected persons should use condoms to prevent transmission of both infections. Now, you all better get that right. All, right. all right, there's no vaccine. No vaccine, we know that. If you give immunoglobulin, it is not effective. Primary prevention, put a condom on. Actually, just wear condoms all the time. But if concurrent HIV infection or multiple partners, it says you know, condoms might, use might not be necessary if you have a heterosexual partnership, mutually monogamous heterosexual. Why? Because I told you it's not that easily transmitted sexually. But if you have somebody out there that's having a lot of sex for whatever reason, um, yeah, use a condom. Secondary prevention, if you have it, no blood, organ, tissue, or semen donation, no sharing of toothbrushes, razors, bloods that's contaminated, or blood contaminated. I mean, because these are all contaminated. If you have cuts and sores, cover them up. Use common sense. These are grandma's rules. HCV positive women need not avoid pregnancy or breastfeeding. It's okay. 
right? Okay, what about work? Most people do work while they're on treatment for hepatitis C. They do. If HCV infected person, if they're cut or they bleed, then you cover the wound. The risk of acquiring HCV from spilled blood is very low. Clean the area with bleach. Again, common sense. Stuff that you do anyway, I'm telling you it's okay. Pregnancy. Routine testing actually right now is not recommended. I said right now. We'll see when the new drugs come out. I mean, it'd be like, remember HIV way, way, way back? It was a big debate about that. But now we have great drugs. We can use them. They're covered. I'm hoping HCV will go that route, OK? Six out of every 100 infants born to HCV-infected women become infected. Now, that's kind of low, but still it is six, right? No treatment or C-section has been proven to decrease this risk. And if maternal HCV viremia is present, then the chance that the baby's going to get infected is indeed higher. And if she's HIV co-infected, then you have a two to three times risk. But what I'm telling you now is there's nothing right now that we can do to prevent this. Although the risk is relatively low, unless I'm HIV, HCV co-infected and I have viremia, then I have a good chance. Maybe I can't, I'm not going to be bold enough to say 30%. I have it on another slide, but I'm not telling you how much because I'm not sure, OK? Because I forgot my slide. All right. So this is false. Immunoglobulin gives some protection. No, it doesn't. It doesn't work. Hepatitis C, in a nutshell, sexually transmitted infections. Here we go. 2010 is the most recent guidelines, CDC treatment guidelines. Rumor has it they're going to get together again. I don't know when. Soon. OK. OK, now let's see if you guys know Alyssa. Alyssa is a 17-year-old female runaway. OK? She's been on the street for six months. She lives with her new boyfriend. She comes to you complaining of 10 days of funny vaginal discharge, mild abdominal pain. She says she's never had an STD. She's only has sex with her new boyfriend, and she engages in oral, vaginal, and anal sex. She's not using birth control. Her last menstrual period was uh, maybe six, maybe eight weeks ago. She only engaged in injection drug use once when she shared her boyfriend's needle. Have you seen Alyssa? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Even before you examine her, you're thinking, OK, what's on your differential? What are you thinking? This funny vaginal discharge. Well, she's 17. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, maybe it's bacterial vaginosis. Maybe she has trichomonas. Maybe it's yeast. Oh my goodness, she has abdominal pain. Does she have PID? Then you're thinking, oh boy, in addition to that, she has oral, vaginal, anal receptive intercourse. All these sites could be infected. Could she have HIV? Six to eight weeks ago, is she pregnant? And then let's throw in this. Boyfriend's using drugs. She only shot up once. What's going on with that? Why is she homeless? Why is she on the street for six months? What happened? Was she abused? Is there psychiatric issues? There's, this is a whole bag of what you do, right? All right. Chlamydia. Let's go through some data. This is the most recent data from the CDC. Young people's disease, right? 15 to 24, boys and girls. And it doesn't always look like boys have as much, but trust me, they do. We just don't screen boys as much as we screen girls. But there it is. It's a young person's infection. It's the most commonly reported STD in the US. And, and the majority of infections in men and women, in males, boys and girls, are asymptomatic, just to make it nastier. So we need to be screening, not necessarily testing. This girl's going to be tested because she has symptoms, but people who are sexually active that come in to see you should be screened. 10 to 15 percent of untreated chlamydia infections go on to PID, clinical PID now. 
okay, that you can have symptoms with. Screening, as I said, is the key to prevention. And you know what we, <laughs> girls who are sexually active and less than 25, when they come in for their routine checkup, hopefully, and they will, or their new birth control pills, they should be screened every year. Okay, primary focus of screening, you're trying to detect and prevent those complications. Now look at this, this makes me crazy. Selective male screening. I know, who's not on here? Who is not on there? 95 year old man who comes in for geriatric evaluation. I don't know, but we just don't have enough money to do all the stuff that we're supposed to do with males. Retest men and women. If they're positive, we're going to retest them. Not rescreen them, but retest them because, because they get chlamydia again. And they get gonorrhea again within a three month period. Maybe because they go back into their same network or they go back to that person that gave it to them in the first place but didn't get treated because you know they didn't have any symptoms and I don't have to go in there. Yes, ma'am. You know, I used to, um, I worked at the Prince George County Jail and I did a, had to do a sexually transmitted disease class for the staff as well as uh -huh. the inmates. And one of the things that came out when I was teaching the class was, and you were talking about, older men who are contacting all kinds of sexually transmitted diseases because, and this came from a gentleman in my class, he said at the, at the senior citizen yes. homes. Yes, yes. Happy, happy Meals? Yes. <laughs> you, can get, you can get anything done or the senior citizen's homes yeah. where apparently ladies are leaving their keys at the door, at the yeah. desk, and yeah. you can get a key and go up. But nobody's teaching them about sexually transmitted no. diseases. But they're or showing, HIV in that. Or they're, but they're showing Cialis and Viagra and all of those. And there's been an upswing You're right. in sexually transmitted diseases in elder people. And what I was teaching was I was telling their sons and daughters, you might want to sit down and have these talks like you do with your children. You might want to sit down Grandma and have Grandpa. them with your mothers and fathers because they're doing things now and they're and everybody's looking at me like you, that's not true and a couple yeah, of guys not my mom and dad right, a couple of guys got up and said we're not dead we do things so you know that's a group that no that's absolutely true and i'm glad i said the 95 year old right. because in the std clinics i mean people come in right then they doesn't matter how old you are if you can walk in you can be there um so yeah, that's a good point. And I will highlight that you have to watch also HIV. Because, you know, elderly, elderly, elderly what? According to this elderly is 30 and above. But um, y'all don't, I mean, we don't think that we can get HIV because that's a young person's disease. And that's not true. There's been a whole section down at, in, in Washington, D.C. when they had the AIDS conference about HIV and aging. Yeah, wow. Florida is really epidemic down Yes, it is. Yes, in Florida. Okay, here we go. So, could she have gonorrhea? Sure. Yeah. Sure she could. Look, right in the right age group, same age group as chlamydia. It's, it's almost like a young person's disease. We should be screening. This is what the United States Preventive Services Task Force says. Look, less than 25, yeah, if I had gonorrhea or another STD, if I am a sex worker, newer multiple partners, inconsistent condom use, drug use, this, this is our clientele. So yeah, we should be screening. All right, now screening in men and women at low risk. Okay, there might be a town in East Elbow, South Dakota, who hasn't seen gonorrhea in 40 years. Okay, I'll give it to you. But if that person who from East Elbow, North Dakota, South Dakota, went down to Vegas, no. <laughs> no. What happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. Nice, but no. Retest men and women again after treatment. Okay, so these are slides that show discharge. Now, when you look at there, you see like a vaginal discharge that's coming out, and you see, if you could see this, a little bit of cervical discharge. This is just to remind you, you know, what this stuff can look like. But Yuck. This is pus. If it looks like pus when you put a swab in there, it's pus. Okay, done. Um, if you could do a gram stain, if you could take that pus and do, do uh, process it and look under the microscope, which many, how many have microscopes still available 
in their clinics. Not a one. That's okay. If you could, you could see it, and if you saw it, you could make the diagnosis, and everything would be sweet and done. Um, but you know what we have now? We, we do have tests. We have nucleic acid amplification tests, which actually you can take that swab. Actually, the girl can say, I don't, want, I don't want to be examined. Okay. Go into the bathroom, use this swab, put it in there, come in, put it in transport media. I can send it off for gonorrhea. Really? You could send that off for gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, HPV, and they're working on HIV, but that's not, no, we're not doing that. But I'm saying, you don't have to get up on stirrups anymore if she doesn't want to. Or she could pee in a cup. So can the guys. Usually the guys pee in a cup and we can test it for gonorrhea and chlamydia. They're, these tests, these nucleic acid amplification tests, are excellent. And you know what? You can use them on her throat and you can use them on the rectum too. Now, the only problem is that sometimes the lab will give you a hassle. LabCorp and, um, what's the other one? What is it? Quest. They can do it. I'm going to show you what the, what the coding is. But they, they can do it. But sometimes the local labs will say, no, it's not FDA approved. Well, it doesn't have to be FDA approved for this. Um, actually, when, what the happens is the, um, the laboratory just verifies that it runs the test and they get as good as outcome as when you did the culture, it's fine. And a lot of these laboratories have, and here are the, you can look up these slides for the rectum, these are the codes, here are the billing codes, it can be done. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Okay, do I have the wrong thing up here? Yes, I do, hold on. Oh no, I don't. This was the old treatment efficacy. This is old old. This is the new. Anogenital infection. You need, and actually, uh, I don't even have, this is even newer. Um, throat, throw throat in there. Rectal, cervical, penile, ceftriaxone 250 plus azithromycin. Both. We're treating them twice for gonorrhea. You see that suffixing? Out. Done. Gone as of last week. Two weeks ago, maybe. Yeah, I haven't really noticed that they're running out of um, uh -huh. medications for. Um, I heard on the radio that they were running out Ceftriaxa? of. Ceftriaxone? Yeah, for um, gonorrhea. Yeah. They were out oh, of yeah, we are. Yeah. We are. Gonorrhea, if you look historically, no matter what we treated gonorrhea with since the 1950s, it has developed resistance. It is a smart little bug. It develops resistance. Isn't it part of uh, individuals not taking all their meds and no. rejecting themselves? No, it's not. No, it is not. Think about it. When you give a shot of ceftriaxone, what's to give? You gave it. Boom. You give ciprofloxacin 400 milligrams, boom, they took it. Now, it's the mist. I'll tell you what it is. This is my theory. As an infect I'll put my infectious disease hat on. Okay, here's the thing. It's the, all the misuse of the medication that we have for other things, like, oh, I need this for, no, I, I, I do it. I did it myself. I have a terrible sinusitis. Now, Dr. Bartlett would say to me, suck it up. It's going to be gone in a couple of days. But no, I have to have azithromycin. I have to have this, that, or something else. Okay, so when we misuse drugs, when we take them inappropriately, or when we don't take them accordingly, you know, like the whole, the bacteria in the back of our throat, which we have to have, the microbiome, picks that nonsense up, says, oh, okay. And that, that bacteria in the back of our throat is are very promiscuous. So if gonorrhea gets back in there, they'll say, hey, I got a good gene I'm going to share with you that's resistant to X, Y, and Z. Bacteria share their resistance. <laughs> so if you really want to monitor this, monitor cultures from the back of the throat. That's where, this is how this stuff starts. It usually picks up resistance pharyngeal. Or it could be rectal, because there's a lot of, you know, your microbiome, you have a lot of bacteria in the bowel too. Bottom line is, however gonorrhea wanted to do it, it has. So now we're stuck with ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. 
And the reason why azithromycin used to be added or doxycycline was because of chlamydia, but now we don't even care. I mean, we're, we're killing the chlamydia. If you have gonorrhea, you most likely have chlamydia. But this is, we all, let me say this. If you have gonorrhea and your chlamydia test for some reason comes up negative, you still treat two drugs. There they are. Cefixime has fallen down. Why? Because it's starting to become resistant to cefixime too. We are scared. Are we scared? Yes, we're scared. No, no, no. See this one, cefpodoxine? No. Gone. Now, you might be able to get away if they're allergic to penicillin with two grams, not one, two grams of azithromycin, which you better watch them there for half an hour. They don't throw that up because it's nasty. Okay? That's Okay, so here you go. Oropharyngeal, you know, really, you should be treating with ceftriaxone. Again, if your back is against the wall and they're really penicillin allergic, then you can get away with azithromycin. But the CDC says if you're going to do that, it'd be really good to have them come back and do test of cure. Now I'm talking test of cure. I'm not talking re-screen, retest. I'm talking test of cure. We haven't done those in, what, 10 years, right? Yeah. And you all better find out where to send the cultures. And you better have the health department's number someplace around. Because if somebody comes back and you swear you treated them for gonorrhea and they didn't have any sex and they didn't get reinfected, and this is a, tr a failure, you should do a culture, because we just don't know. Now, I will tell you that Japan is reporting ceftriaxone resistance. There have been a couple cases of ceftriaxone resistant reported from London. We haven't seen any yet. No, I lied. There might have been one from San Diego. Stay tuned. All right. Treatment failure, suspected treatment failure, um, what, you, what should you do? Well, call an infectious disease consultation, that would be me. Um, <laughs> we were on a CDC uh, conference call about this, and um, my, what I would do, I would definitely make sure I had a culture sent, because I want sensitivity. I, I want sensitivity patterns on this sucker, if, if you think you have a treatment failure. Um, they want to treat with ceftriaxone 250 IM. Personally, if you, if you can convince me that this is an honest to God resistance, I'd give them a gram. I would. Plus azithromycin again. That partner has to be treated and the CDC needs to be. Either through the public, at, through your local health department, or you calling up the CDC. Somebody needs to be told. Because honestly, we don't have any other drugs. Remember spectinomycin? Might be coming back. That's a nasty drug. Okay, here you go. This is suffixine resistance. This is in the light blue, up, up, up. Ceftriaxone has been reported, although it's not been an issue yet, please God. There are no new drugs coming down the pike. Who's watching my time? Somebody, anybody? Okay, um, I'm gonna talk forever. Okay. Um, <laughs> Who is it, who's leading the, the, the uh, wave of the resistance? Well, the West Coast and men who have sex with men. And I mean, this is just my opinion. I don't have any data to back it up, but it may be because we're missing oropharyngeal gonorrhea, because you know oral sex isn't sex, right? Yeah. Um, and we're not screening. And, and you know, people think, oh, well, you know, like here, Alyssa, oh, well, you know, um, if I just do a swab from her vagina, I'll pick out all gonorrhea up. I won't miss anything. No, think again. Because sometimes you can be positive only in the throat. So if you're exposed there, you should test there. Okay, here you go. You got that. Cervicitis. What's new? Do you mean, because I showed you a slide and her cervix was all inflamed. Is there anything new with that? Well, no, not as far as therapy is concerned. It could be gonorrhea. It could be chlamydia. There's a lot of talk about this mycoplasma genitalium, and that's great, and we know it's there, but who can make that diagnosis? Only the researchers. There's nothing out there for us to use commercially to make this diagnosis. Good news is azithromycin or doxycycline, for the most part, kills it, so we're not that much worried about it. 
okay? At least uh, as I stand here before you. PID, 250 ceftriaxone plus doxycycline, give it 100 milligrams twice a day for 14 days, plus or minus metronidazole. And the metronidazole is on here because women who have PID can also have anaerobes that are causing this. Now, okay, all right. I'm going to skip this for time because basically I said it. Okay, so back to Alyssa. On examination, you note she has a homogeneous white vaginal discharge. She has that mucal purulent pus coming out of her cervix. And sure enough, she has mild adnexal tenderness. You look at the gram stain, there's gram negative intercellular diplococci indicative that she has gonorrhea in her cervix. Otherwise, she's normal, quote unquote. Okay? Her urine pregnancy test is positive, and the wet prep from her vaginal secretion shows strychomonads swimming around and she has a high vaginal pH, should be like 4.2, 4.5, she's at 6. All right. Which of the following diagnostic tests, of the following diagnostic tests, which one is not necessary? Okay, gonorrhea and chlamydia testing from her cervix, from her throat, from her rectum, mycoplasma genitalium, gnats from her cer H cervix, HIV serology, Serologic test for syphilis, hepatitis C serology. Okay. The, I don't know if I answered this question, but I'm going to tell you now. This one. We can't, we don't have anything to do this. Everything else, actually, you should test. Even hepatitis C, because she's shot up, right? Doesn't take once, right? Okay. Let me take a second about BV, bacterial vaginosis, which is could be the cause of her discharge, along with the trichomonas. Um, same old, same old, but if you're going to treat bacterial vaginosis, which is, the, you know, the discharge that causes a high pH and a fishy odor, um, we, right now, treatment is not just one stat dose of metronidazole. You have to give metronidazole twice a day for like five to seven days because it's just not going to knock it down. The alternative is this son of, of metronidazole, which is tinidazole. You know, it's equivalent. And it's more expensive, but I'm just saying it's up there. The, if they recur, and oftentimes you see people come in, they, they recur and they recur. First, they should stop douching if they are. Um, and then you try to see, make sure that it truly is bacterial vaginosis and not something else. Um, you can give Metrogel two times a week, and look at that, for months. Oral nitroimidazole, um, not nitroimidazole. And then you give boric acid intravaginally and suppressive metrogel. That's significantly not a good thing. But I'm just saying that this is what some people have done. Boric acid is really toxic. And if you're going to use uh, it, it kills everything. <laughs> um, but, you know, hey, there's some people that are so desperate. But it, do not, I mean, seriously, there's like little troches of that. Stuff don't, I mean, they can't let her around because if like a baby or something, it's toxic. Yes. You cannot have that. It's poison. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. Don't, you don't, don't be bothering about screening pregnant women anymore because as I stand in front of you, it's lost favor. So we don't do that. Okay. Trichomonas, same thing. They're um, same old, same old therapy. There are ways to uh, test, and maybe we're going to have a PCR coming out, which would be great. Because honestly, we're missing 70% of trichomonas infections, and that is an infection of women over 40. So it's very interesting. Um, but we might have better diagnostic tests. When they first hit the market, they're going to be expensive, but hopefully they will come down over time. Like I said, there's no data to guide treatment of male partners with trichomonas. We do treat. It makes sense. It is a sexually transmitted disease. Why don't you find it on guys? Well, probably because guys get it, and because their urine is a low pH, it kills the trichomonads probably. But that's not to say that they can't. A lot of times they, they hover in glands, so they can get in the periurethral glands and ducts, and that's how you can transmit. But if you study guys and you infect them with trichomonads, a lot of them will just pee it out and kill it with the urine. 
I'm not saying that it's not before they transmit it to somebody else. <laughs> HIV and trichomoniasis. This is this HIV positive. We need to be screening these women because. Trichomonas in the vagina of HIV-infected women increases the HIV virus load in the vagina and cervical secretions. We need to get rid of it, okay? Okay, Alyssa. What do you do with Alyssa? Okay. Well, I'm going to give her cefpidoxime, 400 milligrams plus azithromycin, one gram. I'm going to watch her swallow it. Or I'm going to give her a shot of 250 ceftriaxone and a week's worth of doxycycline plus metronidazole for two weeks. Okay, I'm going to give her ceftriaxone 250 ion plus azithromycin 1 gram plus stat dose of metronidazole, then tell her to come back in three days and give her a gram when she comes back. I'm just going to hospitalize her. All right, now, here's the issue. She's 17. She's on the street. She ain't coming back. She has PID. Did I tell you she's pregnant? She didn't come back yet, but I'm telling you, she's pregnant. I, if I could, and I'll try, I'm going to try to put her in the hospital. It'll give me three days. It'll give me three days. And the reason why I want to do that is because I want to call social work. I want to make sure what her HIV test is, why I have her. But hey, sometimes all you do is this, two or three. OK. Now, let me tell you about her partner. I'm, I'm watching. Derek is 19-year-old. He's homeless. He presents because she told him to come on in, because he's a contact PID and he loves her, so he came in. He has no symptoms whatsoever. He says he pr practices survival sex, because he's been on the street. He's had over 20 partners, both male and female, over the past six months, but only her. That's his regular partner. He has had unprotected oral, receptive, and insertive anal and vaginal insertive sex. He injects heroin when he has enough money, but is not addicted. He has had multiple STDs in the past, but he was tested for HIV nine months ago, so he's, it was negative and all's good. On his palms and on his soles, when you examine him, he has a, a, a macular papular rash. He has mucus patches on his tongue, and he has a lesion around his rectum. Have you seen Derek? I have seen Derek. Yes, you have. Here's what his tests show. His urine nucleic acid amplification tests are positive for gonorrhea and negative for chlamydia. His throat is positive for gonorrhea and negative for chlamydia. His rectum is positive for gonorrhea and chlamydia. His serologic test for syphilis is positive at 1 to 512 with a confirmatory FTA positive. His HIV ELISA Western blot is positive. CD4 count is 250. His viral load is greater than a million. And his hepatitis screen, he's hep A and B negative, but sure enough, look. There he is. He's got, oh. OK. Ulcers. And now we're ulcers, you see. Here in the United States, if you see ulcers, you should always do a serologic test for syphilis. You worry about her, um, herpes. Yeah, herpes is everywhere. I mean, I will grant you, herpes is probably the most common cause of ulcers, typical or atypical, in the US. But now, here in DC, in Maryland, in Philadelphia, in our region, we should be testing for syphilis. OK, just send off the test. It's cheap. OK, just do it. Dermatologists have learned this the hard way. Anybody comes in with a rash, automatically. I don't care if you're the pope. Well, maybe we should. <laughs> OK, I'm not saying a word. If you don't know what it is and you treat it empirically and it's still there, then go ahead and send them. Get a biopsy, because it could be cancer. It could. OK, all right. If you could look under a dark field microscope and look for these swimming spirochetes, you can make the diagnosis right there. Nobody, I bet you, nobody in this room has a dark field microscope. Yeah. Okay. 
all the quick tests that we used to have, quick tests I shouldn't say, but the tests where we used to look for like fluorescent treponemes, they've been pulled. The manufacturers don't make them anymore. Not, not, and it doesn't make any money, I'm not doing it. PCR, polymerase chain reaction, no, pulled. Not making enough money. Oh my, my, my. So here we are, having a user brain, who's at risk, even if, if it, you know, this can, I want to say if it, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, remember that all the, I don't care, syphilis, do, it can quack like anything. It doesn't have to, I mean, so if it crosses your mind, maybe this is syphilis, send off a serologic test. And if you're never, ever, ever going to see that person again, shoot them up with penicillin or give them doxycycline. <laughs> now this is an old infectious disease person from Seattle talking to you. I'm never going to see you again. Yeah, you're going to walk with a limp or with doxycycline in your pocket because if I, come on, all right, um, let's go. Well, where's my, where's my timekeeper? I got 10 minutes, thank you. All right, who gets a spinal tap? Because this is a big question sometimes. You good? Okay. Who gets a spinal tap? There's a lot of debate about this. This is what I'm going to tell you. Whether you're HIV positive or negative, whether you have primary, secondary, late, latent syphilis, if you have neurological complaints or an examination, you find they have neurological signs or symptoms, do a spinal tap. If, when they have syphilis. Because syphilis is, neurosyphilis is not just, oh, it's old tertiary syphilis disease. It can happen at any stage, especially in HIV infected individuals. You do a tap because you, if they're positive, and again, how to make that diagnosis is not easy. Yeah, it's not easy at all. If they go into the hospital, they get IV penicillin or ceftriaxone and they have to be followed, but you want to know. And this is just some data about the, 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 the fights that are happening over this. Because some people say, oh, everybody that's HIV infected, regardless of what's going on, needs to have a tap, and you know you can't do that. All right, what's the therapy? Penicillin. If you know I have primary, secondary with the lesions, or within a year, which many of us clinicians, we don't know that. The disease intervention specialists in the health department can help you with that. Usually we say primary, we have a lesion, secondary, you have the rash. Beyond that is unknown duration. But you can get benzathine penicillin, 2.4 million units. Does it hurt? Yes, it does. Usually you break up that into two shots, one dose. Okay, what if I give more? Is that going to help? No, not really. I mean, the, whether I'm pregnant or HIV infected in these stages, given more doesn't that they've looked at it. You don't have to have them come back in a week if they have primary and secondary disease, is what I'm trying to say. What can I do? What if I'm allergic? You can give them doxycycline. Ceftriaxone, you have to be careful um, because there is a cross sensitivity with the ceftriaxone, cephalosporins, and penicillin. I mean, true penicillin allergies now. I'm talking about, you know, the hives and wheezing and all that. Um, not the rash that you got from ampicillin when you were six months old. That's not a, that's, that's, all right. Um, now, do not try to treat them with azithromycin, not in the United States. You're going to find data that's out there from Africa that this works, and it does. But we have too much azithromycin resistance of penicillin that they found by doing fingerprinting, DNA fingerprinting. So we can't use that here. And 15 years ago in Baltimore, 17% of our treponemes, which we collected, when it was, let me tell you, I was one of them, it was hard to do. 17% um, 15 years ago was resistant to azithromycin. California, 100% are resistant now, so we're up there. And if you think it doesn't travel down the beltway, yeah, you know it does. <laughs> All right, this is what they looked for. I mean, so we don't, they're, no, don't use it. Okay, when you have an HIV infected person who has syphilis, and it, you know, no matter if they're HIV positive or negative, let them know that after you treat them, their rash might intensify, they may have some, you know, itching. It's not a full-blown penicillin reaction, it's called the gerish herxheimer reaction, which is, we don't know what it is. We don't know if it's the dying of the spirochetes or if it's an antibody-antigen reaction, we really don't know, but it, it's not penicillin allergy. It happens like 24, 48 hours after the 
after the shot. And you can get this, actually, with Lyme disease, too. Um, what do we, oh, and if the patient actually, if Derek had been on good heart therapy, when we treat him with syphilis, he actually would, would uh, respond better. I mean, it just, you're like, you're, you're helping, you're boosting the immune response. And so Khalil Ghanem, who's at Hopkins, looked at this. And if they're on active antiretroviral therapy and they're HIV positive and they have syphilis, they respond better. Okay, all right, big deal. But they have other issues we have to deal with, like they're out there having sex. Yeah. Trick or so? Oh, yeah. I mean, without being sexually engaged. Or, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. I want you to know. I mean, we talk about no medication is 100% effective. I mean, syphilis and, and penicillin is brilliant. But you will find treatment failures. You will have people that don't respond and need to be retreated. Trichomonas is a great question. Here's what I'm going to tell you I think about trichomonas. I don't know if we're really eradicating trichomonas at all. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody needs to truly look and see. You know, like, let's say I have trichomonas, I come to see you, you treat me. I don't have any symptoms. Somebody needs to see that if I don't have any sex, or I'm constantly using condoms, does it come back on its own? In other words, are you stunning all those trichomonas, slapping them down, and you don't kill them all and it comes back? I wonder about this. Particu and the reason why I do that, I'm, and so I'm saying we do the best we can. We treat with metronidazole, we give them a week, we see what happens. Watch those HIV-infected women because, you know, like let's pretend with most antibiotics you're given something, I'm giving you the antibiotic. It's not killing every single thing in my body. It's just knocking down the growth of that particular, you know, bug. And then your body kicks in and, and, and mops up the rest. With HIV infection, if your CD4 count's low, you don't have a lot of reserve to kick in and mop up the rest. So yeah, you better be watching her for recurrence of her trick. It, and that's why when you look through the treatment guidelines, sometimes with HIV infected individuals, you have to treat them longer or with higher doses. And that you're right. So yes, you're right. OK. All right, now, OK. I'm going to end on this one because I'm running out of time. Somebody else has to lecture, right? Right. <laughs> How does Derek's test impact Alyssa? Oh, my goodness. Well, all his gonorrhea chlamydia action, we're covering her for. We're treating her for gonorrhea and chlamydia. So we got that down, right? OK. Her pregnancy test, urine pregnancy test, is positive. So we have to rescreen her, don't we, for gonorrhea and chlamydia anyway, uh, after we rescreen, definitely in the third trimester. <gasps> Serologic test for syphilis? Oh, yeah. She's a contact. All right. So we need to make sure that she has completed therapy, not got it and back again. If she, if we got her, you know, give her 2.4 million units of, of bicillin, long-acting pe benzathine penicillin, we should have treated her for her syphilis, and the baby should be fine if she chooses to deliver. But we have to make sure she doesn't get infected. Oh, look at this. We have to test her. We have to test her for both hepatitis and HIV. Because now we're in, now we're in some serious. Well, we were been in serious stuff to begin with, but now we really have to pay attention. So this is a little bird's eye view. I didn't say everything. I'm not going to talk about every STDs, but some of the stuff that you see, some of the issues you're facing. Remember the two to tango. And I don't care if it's a slow foxtrot or a fast jitterbug. They're still dancing. Uh, and um, you have your test. If you need the guidelines, go to cdc.gov backslash STD. You can get all this information down, what you need to use, and what's hot off the press. Yes, ma'am. How will treatment change? 
How might you deal with the treatment? Let's say that she tested positive for what she did and her partner would not come in, oh. and she was going to continue to be involved in a sexual relationship with him. Oh, Lord God. You have this person? Yes. Okay. Now you're, no, you're going to dance. Because they've been dancing, but you're going to dance. I mean, you know, what I would do, yeah, I hear you. She's, what, 17? She, okay. She depends on him. She's on the street. He's her, he's probably her psychological, maybe um, financial and otherwise support. He don't want to come in. You're going to do your best dance. I mean, I, you, you, I know this is what you do, right? Tell me if I'm wrong. You talk to her about the risk. You tell her what's happening. You got a 17-year-old. I mean, come on. They're hard. They're hard because they don't, it doesn't click. I mean, there is no, I love him. He is my future. There's no talking about, you know, like 20 years. But you have to find a way to talk to them about, you know, if you're, let's pretend you're 25. And are you going to have this baby? Are you going to deliver this baby? That's the first question. Because that's, that's not going to, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on, but that's going to do your treatment. Are you going to deliver this baby? And if she says yes, I say, well, how would you feel? I mean, I'm dancing. I'm dancing. How would you feel at age 25 and you have this baby and you have HIV? How do you feel about that? Because if, if you don't have HIV today and you continue having unprotected sex with this person, that, think about it. where would you be? Where do you want to be? Visualization. I mean, you, you do the best you can. You do with this patient every day. And you just try to lay out the truth, and then you go home and pray. I mean, that's what you do. But you're doing a good job while you're out there. All right, I'm done. Next speaker. Does anybody have any questions? There's a lot of information that you can pull out of this that's buried in there. But for sake of time, we're going to stop. They're there. CDC website's there for you. Um, does anybody have any questions before we move on? Are we good? Are we good? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. All right.